if I can say this to you, when you receive something from God, the devil's busy trying to steal it from you. You better know that. And he'll launch counterattacks to try to get you to accept it back. So it matters where you go after you're healed. So many times under Jesus' earthly ministry, we see where they went after they were healed. That they would follow Jesus. Peter and John at the gate, beautiful. The man leaped and walked and went with them into the temple. It matters where you go afterwards because that's going to determine what happens to what you received. Amen. Thank God that we can come to a place where we're taught the word so that our faith is fortified. Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you grateful for your local church? Can, can, can I tell you? I'm going to tell you something. Nothing happens during your week that is as important as what happens in the local church. Nothing else. Why? Because this is the appointed place and appointed time where God meets with his family. And nothing else is as important as that. Thank God for your job, but that's not ever going to take the place of meeting with God. Amen. So thank you for coming tonight. And we're honored. It's a joy. It's a privilege to be here. Can, can I tell you, we get so much communication from people all over the world and say, I don't have a local church to go to. They don't have one in their region. You have one. You have a pastor. One of the greatest gifts that God's given you is a pastor. A local church and a church family. Amen. Nothing takes the place. Nothing takes the place. And I find no fault with my church family. I find no fault with my, my, my church family. Amen. Amen. Because God leads us to where he intends to feed us. And he will lead us to those who will lead us to him. Because we, some, we need somebody speaking into our life that knows him better than us. And that's your, that's your pastor, that's your local church. Aren't you thankful? So thankful for, for our pastor and our local church. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, you can turn around to three or four people. Give them a great big God bless you tonight. Then you can be seated. We know this, the devil hates the anointing. He fears the anointing. Why? Because coming in contact with the anointing for one moment undoes his work. And he will work for long periods of time, years and decades, to bring people into bondage and into difficulty. And coming into contact with the anointing for one moment undoes all that work that he's done against us. Is there any wonder why he wants to keep you away from the local church? Because that's the place, that primary place where you come into the anointing. If you were the devil, when we're not, but if you were him, your strategy would be get him away from the anointing. Get him away from someone who's going to bring him into how to walk with God. And uh, so our number one job, we protect the place that God has given us to feed our spiritual lives. Amen. Aren't you thankful? Amen. I tell you, I'm a local church person. Amen. I am local church. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet to the inside to the outside, I'm all about the local church. Because no one can develop rightly without the local church, without having a pastor. Children need a, to be educated just academically. 
They have to have a system they're in, some kind of education system, whether it's a public school, a home school, a private school. They have to have a teacher. Amen. Because if they're not academically educated, they'll struggle unnecessarily in life. Right? Uh, how much more so? The local church is the spiritual school for God's children. And kids that miss school, listen, I, I, I remember missing school. Anybody else skip school or was I the only school skipper? I'd skip school, but it would show up. It would show up. When people skip, things show up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We have um, a few items we want to let you know about. Um, I have three books that specifically deal with the thought life. Um, because um, your mind is Satan's battleground, where he's going to work to try to dismantle your life. It's through the thought life. And uh, God gave you your mind, but not to be your enemy, not to trouble your life. The only way to have a mind that isn't troubled, you've got to renew it with the Word of God. What's it mean to renew your mind? You have to take on God's way of thinking. When you see something in the Word that's different than the way you think, you lay down the way you think and you pick up the way of the Word. It's new definitions, new defining of how you think. And um, the more you renew your mind with the Word of God, the more peaceful your life will be. Your greatest defense against the devil is a renewed mind. You understand that? Because the devil can only work through wrong thinking. A renewed mind brings you into right thinking. God can only work through right thinking. The devil can only work through wrong thinking. You run wrong thinking out, you've closed the door to the devil. You put right thinking in, you've opened the door to God. Amen. Amen. Have you ever noticed this? You'll never, you'll never be able to leave your house and say, you know something, today my mind's a little harassed, I think I'll leave it at home. And I'm going to go out and conduct living? No. You never get to leave your mind behind. So you might as well have a mind you can live with. That's right. Instead of one that's troubling your life. Right. What's that mean? Nobody can lay hands on you and bring you to a renewed mind. Only the Word can do that. How you treat the Word. How we treat the Word and the place we give the Word. Before we make a decision, before we speak words, we have to ask ourselves, what does the word say about this? That's the way a renewed mind thinks. Before it acts, before it speaks, it says, what does the word say? And we bring our thinking, we bring our speaking in line with that word. And as we do, we end up living a life of divine peace. So uh, when I started, Brother Copeland invited me on to the Victory Channel. He asked me to come on daily. Then I only had a weekly broadcast when he asked me, so we went daily when he asked us. And um, I asked the Holy Ghost, what do I, where do you want me to start? And for the first 80 episodes, I dealt with the mind because the body of Christ needs skill regarding the thought arena. Amen. And so there's three books. We only, I think we only have two. I don't think the third one is, oh, we just got the other one back in stock. The, the one that's not here with us is called A Sound Disciplined Mind. Uh, the second one that we have, Peace, Living Free from Worry. And the third one is Answer It. Uh, I tell you, you have to be skillful with your mind. And no one can do it for you. Then we have this one, Love the Great Quest. Um, in starting, I pastored for 25 years there in Southern California. My family helps me pastor now. And um, when we started the church, uh, maybe the first several months, I had begun preaching on prosperity to our congregation. And I was at the third or fourth week of preaching it, and I was getting ready on that Sunday morning to take the pulpit to preach on prosperity again. And God spoke to me and said, you need to back up. And I said, what do you mean back up? I said, prosperity belongs to us. What do you mean back up? He said, until you teach these people how to walk in love in their home, they don't qualify for Bible prosperity. For Bible prosperity. Bible prosperity. 
Why? Because prosperity flows on God's territory. Love is God's territory. You get off, you get off of love, you get off of God's territory, you're, out, you're outside of prosperity. No amount of, no amount of work hours can substitute for being on the wrong property. Amen? I've always said to our congregation, because you get into strife in your home, you get into strife in your marriage, it will shut down the flow of, of God's blessing, the flow of prosperity. Why? Because God's not flowing in that. He doesn't withhold blessing. We stepped out of the flow that he's moving in. When we step into strife, we just stepped out of God's flow. And so his flow can't reach our need. He doesn't withhold. He doesn't give and then take back. Give and take back. It's us. What ground are we standing on? And so um, I would ask my congregation this. I said, before you get into that strife in your marriage, ask yourself this question. Do I have enough money to fund this strife? <laughs> and let me tell you the answer. I don't care how rich you are. No, you don't. <laughs> uh, you're going you're gonna to deal with prosperity. You're going to have to deal with every feature of man. Because whether you know it or not, um, there's an invisible thread to your love walk to your wallet. Uh, fussing and fighting will keep you broke. Keep you broke. Praise the Lord. Well, see, we all, we all talk about a miracle now, aren't we? We all want our miracle. But how many of you know, um, God's not building a financial portfolio in your life. Not building a financial portfolio. You know what he's doing? He's building a man. He's building a woman. And out of that built man and out of that built woman comes a healthy financial portfolio. But God's not bypassing the man to build the, the financial portfolio. He's going to deal with the man. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're going to help you. Love the great quest, and uh, that's out there. And then we have this one, God the revealer of secrets, teaching you how to know the will of God for your life. I never told my kids, you can be anything you want to be. That's not true. You cannot be anything you want to be. Not be happy. Uh, you can be anything God wants you to be. You can be anything. Because anything you want to be will cheat you. Because what God has for you is so much greater than what you could ever dream up or formulate for your own life. So God, the revealer of secrets, he's not trying to hide his plan for your life. He's looking to reveal it. He's not a hider. He's a revealer. Amen. Amen. And he'll reveal your plan, the plan of God he has for your life. Then we have this one. I have a supply. Do you know whenever, um, whenever you were, uh, you bought a home, uh, when you bought that home, it came with a kitchen it came with a, a bedroom. It came with a family room. It came with a restroom. It came with things. It was built in. Uh, with everything that God leads you to, he's already built in a supply for every place he's ever led you to go. Hallelujah. Amen. It belongs to the plan. Yes. It belongs to the plan, just like a kitchen belongs to the plan of a house. Uh, there's a supply. You don't have to talk God into a supply. Just stay with the plan. The plan's already supplied. Amen. Praise the Lord. So those things are out there. They'll be a blessing to you. Turn with me, if you would, tonight to Ephesians chapter 1. I won't, I won't preach too terribly long, I don't think. Uh, we want to take time to minister to people uh, individually, as I said we would do last night. How many of you know you? Many of you have already gotten ministered to. Yeah. Hallelujah. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 16 Paul is writing, and uh, he's recording something he prays for the believers. Always go through the epistles of the New Testament. The Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They record Jesus' earthly life and ministry. But the books after that are the epistles written to the church. So always draw your prayer life out of those books, the epistles, and go through and highlight prayers that are recorded because those are spirit-given prayers. They're spirit-led prayers. And if you will learn to pray those, you will pray the word and you will get results. 
You won't just pray emotions. You won't just pray feelings. You won't just pray the way you were raised. You want to pray the word. Pray in line with the word. So always note in your Bible, highlight maybe in a different color, these prayers uh, that are recorded in the epistles. And this is one of them, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. Paul writes it. He said, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is what he prayed. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and give unto you the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of him. And I could say this, of what it means to be in him, in Christ. Verse 18, and he wanted them to receive this wisdom and revelation. How, is he going to re how are they going to receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation? Verse 18 tells us how. The eyes of their understanding, or we could say this, the eyes of their spirit being enlightened. What's this mean? Things have to dawn on your spirit before they'll work in your life. Yeah. You, have to, you have to see some things with your spirit. You have to grab it with your spirit. When, when it dawns on your spirit, now you take ownership of it. Yeah. And you can't spend what you don't own. Many times people just mentally read something, but it's not dawned on their spirit. They're trying to spend it and trying to make it, and they go, it doesn't work. No, it has to dawn on your spirit. And Paul said that this would dawn on your spirit, that you would gain the spirit of wisdom and revelation. How? The eyes of your spirit being enlightened, that they see it. Yes. That they be enlightened. Number one, what's he want their eyes to see? Number one, that they may know what is the hope of his calling. Well, what is that? We could say it this way that you would know who you are in Christ. That's what he's saying, that you would know, number one, who you are in Christ. Because who you are is, is where victory comes from, who you are in Christ, not who you are in the flesh. Uh, you're so much better in him than out of him. You're complete in him. Focus on who you are in him, not who you are in you. That's where all the problems stem from, who we are in us. But all the, all, the, all the divine and all the help and all the answers flow from who we are in him. So he says, I pray that the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened, that number one, they will know what is the hope of his color. We could say it this way, who, who you are in Christ. Number two, that your eyes, you, it would dawn on you what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Well, what does that mean? That you would know how rich you are because you're in him that you would know what belongs to you because you're in him. Verse 19 says, shows us the number three thing he's asking, and that you would know what is exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. What's he talking about? He's saying that you would know what you can do because now you're empowered. You live by divine power. There's a divine power on the inside of you. We talked a little bit about it last night. Uh, don't leave it unaccessed. Stir up the gift that's on the inside of you. Stir up that anointing that abides within you. Stir up that divine power and draw on that power as you go about your day. Yes. Say, Father, I depend and I draw on that anointing that abides within me to assist in this matter. Amen. What's that mean? You turn this way toward your spirit and not just toward your mind. You turn toward your mind, you're going to get overwhelmed. You turn toward your spirit, you're going to access a flow. You're going to access that anointing that's in there to enable you to live the life that God authored for you to live. Can I tell you this? Jesus' life was an example showing us how the new creatures to live. Amen. Oh, that, that, the way he lived was amazing. Yeah, it was an example of what's available to us. Amen. So, uh, verse 19, that you would know what is exceeding greatness of his power. Look at this. To us, we who believe. It's already in our direction. We don't have to coerce him. Oh, God, send me power. It's to us, word. Who are the ones that are going to employ that power? The ones who believe it. I believe the power of God's in me. Amen. Remember what we read last night, Paul, uh, that you would know uh, that your faith wouldn't stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I believe in the power of God, and it's in me. It's in me. It's not just in pastor. It's not just in the church building. It's in me. 
It's in me. I believe in the power. And so when I go out and find my next job, there's power working for me. When I go to buy that home, there's power working for me. Amen. When I'm dealing with this problem, I have divine power assisting me in this. Don't leave the power on the shelf. Draw it out and spend it. How do you do it? With you believe in it. And what you believe, you got to put it in your mouth. Amen. The faith in your spirit is going to be silent until you say something. You can have a heart full of faith and it be silent. Your faith is unheard until you speak. And your faith is unspent until you speak. How do you draw the faith that's in your spirit out of your spirit through what you say and through what you do? And until we say that faith that's in us, that power of God that's in us will remain inactive. James even said that some have dead faith. They still, they have faith, but it's dead. Uh, if, if, if there were a corpse in front of you, uh, if we were to go to a funeral and there was a corpse laid out, we can see there's a body there. It doesn't mean they don't exist. Dead faith, it doesn't mean faith doesn't exist. It means it has no movement. And too many of us, if we're not careful, we let our faith go dead, no movement. Your faith has to be reborn every day. What's that mean? You got to speak it every day, every day, every day, every day. It's our lifestyle. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by saying. Amen. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. Faith calls. Faith has a call to it. Romans chapter 4 verse 16 talks about 16, 17, 18, talking about Abraham. It said he called those things which be not as though they were. What's he mean? It, it wasn't there, so he called it, get here now. Get here. Get here. Amen. Because it's already authored in yours in the spirit realm, but it's your call of faith that transfers it from the unseen realm to the seen realm. Your answer exists in two realms. It exists in the unseen realm, but it'll never benefit you on this earth until it comes to the seen realm. And it's your call that, that transfers it from one realm to the, to the next realm, from the invisible to the visible. And people are waiting for God to send it. He's waiting for you to call it. Uh, I, I, I don't know about you. I, I like dogs. Anybody else in here like dogs? I like all animals. I like cats. I like it all. And at one point, we had five dogs. But we were on five acres, so like each dog got an acre. You know? <laughs> there was room for them. And even though they would be out exploring all over that acreage. I knew I had them, but they didn't show up till I called. Uh -huh. That's right. You can know you have healing, but it won't show up till you call. That's right. And you can know that you have supply from God, but it won't show up till you call. Amen. Uh, faith is a call. Faith is just always talking and calling. Calling it, calling it, calling it, calling it. And the devil will say, well, see, that doesn't work because it's invisible. No, faith is for what's in the invisible, devil. Don't you know that? Of course you don't know that because you don't have the right kind of faith. When, you're, when, it's, in, in, when it's in its invisible form, congratulations, your faith can work. Once it's in the seen form, faith is no longer called for Faith calls those, things, calls those things which be not as though they were. So let's put, if we could say that, that's one definition of faith. Do you know that? I call myself healed in the face of pain. I call myself healed in the face of immobility. I call myself whole in the face of something lacking. You do it. Amen. Uh, and we could say it this way. If we could find this word faith and put the definition for faith in that scripture. The just shall live by faith. Let's put the definition in the just shall live by calling those things which be not as though they were. This is the victory that, overcome the wor that overcomes the world, even our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our calling those things which be not as though they were. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without calling those things 
which be not as though they were, it's impossible to please God. God takes pure delight when you talk about the invisible as though it's visible. Amen. Because we're not living based on what we see. We're living based on what he said. I'm reminded of uh, this woman. She went to the doctor just for a physical. And when they were doing examination of her breast, they, uh, they found a lump. And they rescheduled her to come back for an ultrasound. And so she went back at a later date and they... She was on the examining bed, and the doctor had that ultrasound machine, and um, he was looking at the screen, and he was running that, that, that wand, that device, over the area of concern. And so he turned the screen toward her and pointed to the screen, and there was a, 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 an area that showed something there. And he said, now, see, this is the point of concern that I have. And she was laying on that examining bed, and she said within herself, she said, oh, God, if I only hadn't seen it. Because it's not something she could feel. But she said when it, she was realizing that when she saw it with her eyes, it made it more real to her. <clears throat> so she sang quietly to God, oh, God, if I only hadn't seen it. And God spoke back to her as she laid on that examining table. And he said, is what you see greater than what I say? We don't live by what we see. We live by what he says. We live by words. We live by words. We live by words. We live by words. Words. And she said, oh, God, forgive me. She said, no, what I see is not greater than what you say. Forgive me. And the moment she said that, because that screen was turned toward her, the doctor and her both were looking at it, and a nurse and the moment she said that, a wide circle of light appeared on the screen. And as they watched that screen, that circle of light got smaller and smaller until it encircled that lump and went And they all saw the thing disappear on the screen. Why? Because she held to what he said in the face of what she saw. Faith is not changing what you believe just because you see what you don't want to see. Uh -huh. Amen. But Paul said, I pray that you would have revelation, number one, of who you are in him. What belongs to you, number two, what belongs to you because you're in him. Number three, what you can do because you're in him. You've got power on the inside of you. No use living a powerless life when you're wired. No use this building sitting in the dark and all you have to do is flip the switch. We talked about it last night. No use sitting in the dark when light's available. No use sitting full of power but not adding faith to it and sitting in the dark, so to speak, the dark of lack, the dark of symptoms, the dark of pain, the dark of fear. No use living that way when we can just employ, add our faith to that power, and that power will do a work. But notice Paul said this power, it'll flow for those, uh, it belongs to us, but it's to us who believe. That's you. You believe. You believe. You believe. Amen. Amen. Um, I, so, I so love in verse 19 the way it's worded. There's adjective upon adjective heaped up to describe the power. The exceeding greatness of God's power. Uh, know this, that the God's power that's in our direction, it's an exceeding greatness. It's an exceeding power. It exceeds all other power. It's out in front. It exceeds all demon power. It exceeds all human power. It exceeds all mental power. It exceeds all financial power. It exceeds it all. The word exceed definition is just, it's beyond the limit. 
beyond the limit. Why? Other powers have limits. God's power, no limits. No limits. No limits. Amen. It's a greater power. It's a superior power. Amen. All other powers have their limits. God's doesn't. There's no limit. The power of God is so impressive. You know, when, when the medical field is endeavoring to help people, let's say there's a growth and they take radiation to that and they're trying to kill that area. The only thing is they kill unhealthy cells, but they also kill healthy cells. And they try in killing the disease. Many times they end up killing parts of the body, right? They're endeavoring to help, but the power of God is so impressive. <laughs> it goes in. Each individual cell that isn't right, it'll make it right and leave the healthy cells completely intact. It's impressive. The power of God that's in us, that deals, that we have to deal with, it's not experimental. (laughs) It's so accurate. Amen. Exceeding greatness of his power. Uh, It's superior to all other powers. There's no equal to God's power. Nothing equal. Uh, Any opposition that comes against you is not an equal opposition. Amen. No power beside God's power is a close second to God. God's power is so far out in front. It's so far out, it exceeds. Uh, and exceeding, the exceeding greatness. If, this, if, it's, if there's the greatness of God's power, what's that mean? If, it, if it's a greater power, and it is, what's that mean? There's a lesser power. Yeah. The devil is a lesser. Yeah. And opposition is lesser. Yeah. Challenges are lesser. Why? Because the greater is for you. Quit being impressed by what's lesser. Be occupied with what's greater. Talk about what's greater. Employ what's greater. But so many times people are occupied, preoccupied, and fearful of what's lesser. Amen. Um, Just for time's sake, let me go back. Let's finish reading this passage, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which God wrought or worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, far, not barely above, far above far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. Know this, when Jesus was raised from the dead, why does it single out far above all principality, power, might, dominion? Why does this scripture single that out? Because all those demon powers piled up trying to stop his resurrection and they weren't worthy. They couldn't do it. Verse 22, and has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And you hath he quickened. And you, he tagged you on to this flow. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So when Paul is talking about this power of God that is to usward who believe, he doesn't compare it to creative power that happened at at the seven days of creation. He doesn't compare it to miracle power when the Red Sea parted. He doesn't compare it to multiplication power when the fish and the loaves were multiplied. He compares it and demonstrate it, demonstrates it to when Jesus was raised from the dead. It's resurrection power. This is the power that's in us, and he's showing that this is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Listen, it didn't just raise Jesus from the dead, but you know what else it did? It, it raised him from the dead, but it exalted him to God's own right hand. It gave him authority. 
over all powers, good and evil. It gave him a name above every name. It put all things under his feet. It made him the head of the church. The power did all of that. And this is the same power that's in your direction if you'll believe it. If you'll talk about it. Talk about the power that's in you that, that is there to do a work. Years ago, I was in a, a minister's, a pastor's church, and I had been preaching because I have many sermons, several sermons on the power of God, and I had been preaching along that direction. And the pastor called me. I had preached there on a Sunday. I had flown back home, and I was home on Monday, and he called me on Monday evening, and he said, I've got to tell you what happened. He said, you were preaching here yesterday morning on the power of God, and he said, um, about 4 o'clock this morning, there's a family in our church, and their son was driving to work about 4 o'clock this morning, and a drunk driver hit him and completely destroyed the car. And they contacted the parents. They got hold of them. They went to the crash site. They had to work for over an hour with those jaws of life where they cut the car apart to get someone out. The car was so mangled and wrapped around, they said, there's no way. There's just no way. They couldn't reach the young man. He was, he was mangled up in this, and they just pulled out the body bag and laid it by the car. There was no sound. They would try to talk to him. He, he, there was no reply. They told the parents. They said, uh, there, there's no way he survived this. So they stood by the side of the road on the other side and watched them work that jaws of life trying to open up that car to get his body out. And they said this, there's power in that car. There's power in our son. That power is in there with him. That power is making him whole. That power is making it right. For an hour, they stood on the side of the road, and just between themselves, they talked the power. After an hour, they finally got that car cut apart, and the pastor said, Pastor Nancy, that boy walked out of that car. That boy walked out of that car. Back home. Back home tonight. Why was it? Now, it could have turned out different. It could have turned out different if they would have just been occupied with what was lesser instead of being occupied with what was greater. That's our problem. Lesser can be louder. Let me tell you, the devil's got to be loud because he's got no foundation under him. He's got to convince you through loudness. God doesn't have to be loud because he's right. He doesn't have to be loud. The Spirit of God doesn't have to yell at you. You can have that still, small voice. Why? Because rightness doesn't need volume. That's why the devil is so loud with the symptoms, so loud with circumstances, so loud with threats against the mind because he's got no foundation under him. And he's got to dupe you into thinking he's greater. If he was so great, he wouldn't have to be so loud. But he's lesser. Because we have an exceeding greatness of his power. It matters what you remember at a time of opposition. Um, a <clears throat> one minister went over to a church I want to say it's in Puerto Rico. And this testimony was told to this minister friend of mine firsthand to the person it happened to is the one that told it to the minister. Um, but there was a woman. She was 21 years old. She had four children. Her mother was... A praying woman. The, the daughter 
21 years old, had the kids in the car and was driving somewhere and they were hit and had a critical, critical accident. When they got to the, the paramedics got to the, the wreck site, the children, they were all, they had all been thrown from the car. The children, they were able, they went first to the mother and they said, she's dead. And they just walked off and left her. She had gone through the windshield. It had taken off. And I'm not trying to be uh, graphic, but to tell you the greatness of God. It took off the top cap of the skull. And so what was in there came out. So when they, the medics showed up, all they did was just scoop up remnants and put it by her head. And then they went on to the children because the children were still alive. So they went to the children one by one. They were able to get the children going. And they ended up being able to transport the children to the hospital. They all lived. But the mother did not. They took her to the morgue. And when they took her, of course, they put her in a body bag. And they just scooped up every remnant and just set it in the body bag by her head. Took her to the morgue. And then they called the mother who lived what would be to us about a state and a half away. It took about a 12 hour so it, uh, drive. But they called the mother and said, your, your family's been in an accident, told the condition of the children, but said your daughter did not make it and described to her the condition they found her in. And the mother said, oh, all she needs is a little bit of resurrection power. It matters what you remember. It matters what you remember. She said, I'll be there. So she gets in her car. It's a 12-hour drive. She's praying in the spirit the whole time. There was a man that was an employee there in the morgue. He's in the room where this gal's body bag is. He's on the other side of the room. He's doing something. And he hears a sound. And he goes... He, his immediate thought was this, muscles, there can be all kinds of nerve things and function, but it, it's just nerves and muscles. And so he didn't think too much about it until it kept happening. And then he goes over. And he unzips the body bag and her eyes open. And he said, no. He said, no, you cannot. He said, and it wasn't that he did not want her to live. He said, you're such a mess. Your body is devastated. It's not good that you're showing signs of life. Your body is absolutely devastated. But because there's now signs of life, he has to have her transported back to the hospital. So when the mother arrives, he find, she finds out she's no longer at the morgue, she's at the hospital. So she goes into her hospital room and crawls up on top of the bed and stands over her and starts declaring, power is working, power is working. See. The exceeding greatness, the exceeding greatness, it exceeds the devastation of that accident. The exceeding greatness of his, pow his power to usward who believe, who believe, who believe. It's spendable to those who believe. It's not spendable to those who don't believe. It's available to all, but it's only spendable to those who believe. So the mother 
every day. As long as that daughter, daughter was in the hospital, they just sewed her up as best they could. But she's missing parts of her brain were devastated. And they said, she'll be a vegetable. The doctor said that. And you can understand why they would say that. But the mother just kept at it. Why? She believed in resurrection power. See, resurrection power with Jesus, it didn't just do one thing. It raised him, but it seated him. It authorized him. It made him the head of the church. And she just kept calling on that power to keep doing its work and keep doing its work. And um, when she came, and she had gone into a coma, when she came out of the coma, she had the mentality of a seven-year-old. And for a period of months, she would sit with her own children, not recognizing they're her children, and she would play with them at their own age because she herself came back with the mentality of a seven-year-old. But the mama kept at it. And within a short amount of time, she's completely normal. Amen. Completely normal. Now, that happened to this daughter when she's 21. When she was 50, she decided to become a private detective. She liked those kinds of things, so she decided to do that. So when she went to join, be hired, they sent her for certain just tests that have to be done because they've got to trust people, you know? So they sent her to the doctor, and this is the first time she had been examined since she had been dismissed from the hospital as a 21-year-old. And the doctor comes in the room, and he said to her, you can't be alive. <laughs> she said, well, I am. Normal. In her conversation and her body, everything, normal. He said, no, you can't be alive. She said, why can't I be alive? He said, you have no frontal lobe. It's empty. There's not a frontal lobe there. What's this mean? God can make you function with or without. After she was raised up, she had another child. This child became a pastor. This preacher friend went to preach for the son who was a pastor. And now this 21-year-old is an 85-year-old telling the story of her own life to this preacher. Why? Because the mother remembered all she needs is resurrection power. All she needs. That's all she needs. Now, see, we look at that, and now, that's a very dramatic event, is it not right? But it demonstrates that if the mother would have decided to believe, and can I tell you this? Don't try to change the doctor's right, 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 right. diagnosis to you. Don't try to say, I, you're wrong. No, it's not their confession. It's your confession. Right. It's not their confession that runs your life. It's your confession. So it's not about getting the doctor to change. Thank the good doctor for all they know. And then take care of business with God. Because it's not what they say. It's what you say. Don't worry about someone else's confession when you've got your own. But the mother did not make it a big deal. If she could have, there could, she could have just fallen apart and gone into a drama mode. And if she would have, she'd have buried her daughter. Yeah. It matters that you have these truths big in you so that the moment of crisis, you turn toward the right truth yeah. instead of turning toward what's being told you. 
Amen. Amen. Paul said that it may dawn on you who you are, what you have, and what you can do. That it has to dawn on you here. How do you take these truths of the word and make them real to you? One way, meditation. You have to meditate on these things. Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law, this book, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Keep it there as a lifestyle. What's this mean? It's a lifestyle of faith. It's not just moments of faith. It's a lifestyle of faith. Why did this mother's mind immediately go and her choice immediately go to resurrection power because of her, her lifestyle? Because under pressure, you're going to turn to your lifestyle, whether good or bad. You're going to draw on your lifestyle, your habits of your lifestyle. So we have to do as Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate, meditate, meditate. What's it? What's it mean? Speak it to yourself. Say it to yourself. I belong to him. He belongs to me. The greater one is in me. The greater one is working in me. The greater one is at my disposal, at the disposal of my faith, that when I speak, he performs. See, you have to talk this to yourself. You have to talk it to yourself. How did, how, how was it possible that Moses could not get a he, a one generation, the first generation of Hebrews into the promised land. But Joshua was able to turn a non-arriving, complaining, murmuring people into an arriving people. They took what God said and put it in their mouth. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. Let's go get it. God gave it to us. It's so easy to say what God says because you're always saying something. You might as well say what he says so you can get what he got. Why? Meditation is you just saying over and over, building in you. If God told you, uh, I want you to start a business, then that's all you have to do is say, God, has called me to start a business. God told me. God said it. God said it. See, when you know what God said and opposition comes, you already have your answer ready. Amen. You say what God said. When my husband went home to be with the Lord, I can't begin to tell you the, the, the dog pile of events and opposition, and every day I had to answer it with what God said to me, what God said. God said this, and it looked like it was going the wrong direction. I don't care what it looks like. God said this. You have to know what God said so you'll know what to say when the opposition shows up. You tell your need what God says. You tell opposition what God says. And Joshua caused the people to be an arriving people because he meditated on what God said. I've given you this land. It's a good land. It flows with milk and honey. He had already built that in him. Him and Caleb did. The other spies didn't build it in them. And they held out a nation because they refused to believe. When we refuse to believe, what are we holding our family out of? We owe it to our family to believe. We owe it to our local church to believe. If we, if we refuse to believe, what are we holding our church family out of? What's, what, what vision is in the pastor's heart that needs our faith? It does matter that we believe. And God gives you your own life to practice on so that when you get to the church, you already know how to do it. Amen? This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate therein day and night so that you may 
observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then you'll make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Notice that in that verse, God isn't mentioned. Notice in that verse, the devil isn't mentioned. You know what's mentioned? You're mentioned five times, and the word's mentioned three times. What's that mean? What you do with the word determines your life. That's the law of success, what you do with the word. What you do with the Word. Not what the pastor does, what you do with the Word. Our life is a picture today of what we're doing with the Word. Yes. Now, did you hear that? Today, you can look at your life and go, now I know what I'm doing with the Word by looking at my life. If it's not the way you want it to look, do something more with the Word. I can't tell you how many times people come up in a ministry line and say, Pastor Nancy, do something. You know, I, I'm just so, my mind is so troubled and harassed. Well, listen, all I can do is like jumper cables. Yeah. <laughs> I can give you a jump start. But I can't go home with you and keep your mind right. I, you have, you, 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 you and the Word. You and the Word. You and the Word. Not Pastor and the Word. You and the Word. You and the Word. When that mama got that phone call about her daughter, in a moment we knew what she was doing with the word. Because she said, all, all she needs is a little bit of resurrection power. What you start saying first when pressure comes shows how big the word, what place the word has in you. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> that we would know who we are in him, what we have and what we can do because we're in him Amen. and we have his power. Amen. On our website, you may have it here, I don't know, but on our website, we list like 140 in him scriptures, in Christ, in whom, that tells you who you are. It will get rid of every bad, poor self-image. It'll redefine so that you're not walking according to who you are in the flesh, but who you are according to him. You can download that for free. Just go to our website, JesusTheHealer.org. You can download that for free. Feed on it. The most spiritual people you'll ever find are those who meditate on the Word, not just admire it and not just appreciate it, but they meditate on it. Amen? Power's in you. The power's in you. Talk it. Talk it. Meditate on it. The power of God's in me. The power of God's in me. The, the power of God is changing this situation. It's not me changing it. The power that's in me. And I give that power free reign to flow. I'm not going to lock it down by not saying. I'm going to let that power flow, flow freely by speaking it, speaking it, speaking it. Amen. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the power of God. I believe. You need to meditate on that. Amen. I'm kept by the power of God. I live by the power of God. Amen. I walk by the power of God. I think right by the power of God. Amen. Stand with me. Ooh. Man. Yeah. How'd that go for you? It's good, isn't it? We need, we need this. We need this. Sometimes I, I almost feel like you hear these stories and they seem so fantastical. But you realize that these are the types of things that we should be a part of more in our life in some form or fashion. Sometimes you think about, man, there, there's empty chairs in here right now. Well, I wonder what would happen if people who are in our world saw the power of God on display like that on a more regular basis. My guess is that they would be drawn to whatever's happening in your life and the things that happen around you, and they'd have to get what you get. They have to get what you have, right? I think we need to take more of a responsibility to, to be this way. And this is why the Word is so important, because you have to have the Word. The Word is the only thing that can produce this type of faith that was talked about tonight. You know how? Do you know how that woman was able to live without a frontal lobe? Faith. And how, how does the power of God? Through faith. Do you know what faith is? There was nothing there. There was nothing up there. Faith is, now faith is, the substance of things hoped for. It's a substance. It's real. It's tangible. 
It's something. It was the, there's a, there was a substance there. It wasn't the frontal lobe. It was faith. It was the substance of things hoped for. It was evidence of things not seen. Her brain was able to function off of faith without a frontal lobe because faith is a substance. It's real. And I love what she said. We have got, we have, we have got to start placing so much more emphasis on the greater than the lesser. Man, the greater one is who lives on the inside of us. And, and we listen and give so much place to the lesser in our lives because it's loud. And it's so true. The devil has to be loud because he has no foundation for what he's doing. Have you ever noticed the people, even these things you see on social media, the people who are loud and ob- ob- obnoxious, they don't have much of a foundation for what they're talking about. When you're right, you don't have to be loud because you're right. I don't have to argue with someone when I'm right. I'm right, you're wrong, be loud, yell, but you're wrong. But, but who are people looking at? What are people being drawn to? The lesser, the one who's just being loud and all this talk and all this stuff. We've got the greater one on the inside of us. He's greater, and that's where our attention needs to be. I want when these things come up in our lives, and sometimes they don't have to be these horrific things that happen, but when we rely on the greater one, and we call on the greater one in our life, in, in just everyday life, everyday life, calling on the greater one, the greater one. He's on the inside of us. That resurrection power, that resurrection power is in you at all times, at all times. I love what he, she was saying about those parents who were standing across. They were saying there's power. There's resurrection power in that car right now. There's power. I mean, I don't know if we think like that enough. Like, oh, there's, there's resurrection power in my spouse, in my kids. We've got all that we need. We can go start changing things right now with resurrection power. Oh, it's so good. I hope it stirred you up. It stirred me up. Faith, 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 faith. You get the word, you've got faith. Now you've got substance. Your life can run on something now. It can run. That's how it's supposed to run. That's how the just, that's how the righteous were to live, by faith. Amen? Amen. Well, we love you guys. Um, Let's take this and let's apply it to our lives. Let's do something with it tomorrow. Shall we? I think we shall. We'll do that, and then we'll be back here on Sunday uh, to continue our series on whole family. All right? You guys have a great evening. Have a great week. We'll see you then.